This session is brought to you by Earth Buddy Pet, dedicated to providing you the very best organic CBD for pets. Welcome to our kickoff party for this amazing anxiety in dog summit that is going to help you help your anxious dogs so much. I've been so busy in so many different ways getting everything ready with the Pet Summits team for this. And today we're gathering three of our expert speakers to um, get you excited and get you motivated to come and join us so that you can learn so much from so many world leading experts who are going to be sharing their wisdom on this summit. So I'm just going to introduce the three beautiful people that we have here on this um, initial thing. We've got Teodi Anderson. Uh, Teodi has been a professional dog trainer for more than 26 years. She's the vice president of a dog's best friend in Port Lauderdale, Florida. She's the author of the Dog Behavior Problem Solver, which is the ultimate guide to dog training, super simple guide to house training and more. And she's been involved as a pet therapy volunteer for more than two decades with a variety of special dogs and one amazing cat. So welcome, Teodi. Uh, then we have Lisa Spector. Lisa Spector's Jullard music degree has gone to the dogs and she couldn't be more thrilled. Uh, Spectre's piano recordings for dogs are soothing pets in over 1,500 shelters worldwide. Uh, she's been featured on NPR, the CBS Early Show, CBS Australia, and Dog TV. Lisa is the only classical pianist to reach Billboard's classical top 20 chart with pet music, which I think is pretty amazing. Lisa is the host of the My Zen Pet Podcast and the founder of the Dog Gone Calm Club, her latest album, Dog Gone Calm, Volume 1, can be heard on all streaming channels. And I just realized I didn't really introduce myself. I'm Dr. Edward, the healing vet, and I'm the host of this Anxiety Summit. I'm a holistic veterinarian. I've been in practice for 27 years, and I'm the founder of the Whole Energy Body Balance Method, which is a profoundly healing body work and energy healing modality for pets, for people, and for horses. And then we have our final um, member of the panel here who's Sean Zaya, co-founder of Earth Buddy. After graduating from the University of Northern Colorado in 2008, Sean had only one career, that's helping pets stay healthy. From working for major pet food brands to large pet supply distributors, I can confidently say that he absolutely loves what he does. Sean has had the fortune and honor to have rescued many dogs throughout the past 10 plus years, and there's a really special place in his heart for rescues. Sean is extremely passionate about keeping our pets healthy and he creates all of their products with that in mind. We hope that the Earth Buddy products can give your furry kids the same quality of life and dignity that it's given so many pet owners in the USA. Now, of course, I haven't introduced Mitzi. Mitzi's my small fluffy friend and companion here. And now we've also got the ancient Whippet coming to join us. I'm just going to settle Pearl down here. She's got a bit of dementia and separation anxiety. So um, I, if I don't settle up here, she'll be sitting down there on the floor um, looking at me like this going, what are you guys doing up there? I feel left out. We can't have that. You know, this is why we're here is, is for the dogs. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about anxiety in dogs and why it's so important that you gain a deeper understanding of what anxiety is, how to pick up on it, because quite a number of uh, dog carers either don't even realize that their dogs have early signs of anxiety. This is really common. Or the other one, I went to a, a veterinary conference just last week in Darwin and we had a behavior stream. One of the vets, expert specialist vets, there was talking about how many people who have dogs with anxiety who don't even seek help for them. They just think, oh, you know, my dog goes crazy in thunderstorms. We only have a thunderstorm a few times a year, so, so they'll be right. And I think that one of the reasons people don't do that is that they, they don't realize just how painful and distressing and how much suffering these anxious animals um, experience when they do have this kind of distress. And now we've got the third member of our family coming in here, Pavadi the cat. So we've got we've got everyone. 
We've got everyone joining in. All my animals have come to help. She's always video bombing me, Pavati. So I'm just going to sit it down there and we'll just have to roll with all these animals as we go. Let me rearrange Mitzi a little bit. He's now trying to get in to get more pats because he's jealous about the cat coming in. So anxiety. Anxiety in essence <clears throat> is a dog who has got fear. There's mental, emotional fear and distress. The animal is um, worried that something awful, something dangerous or something that they perceive to be really dangerous to their, effectively they think it's going to kill them. Um, and that's why they, they have this perceived threat. And when the animals have this idea of there being a, a, a terrible thing that's going to harm them, then they have a whole lot of physiological responses in that they, they, they get a fight flight response. They get a, an increase in adrenaline. And with an animal that then goes into these higher levels of arousal, so a healthy animal should be in what I call a green zone of arousal. Um, then they can go, you can have healthy orange zone when animals are in healthy play and arousal, but if they have anxiety, they go into the orange zone and then there's a threshold where they cross the red line into the red zone. And at that point, you've got animals that they, their brain is turned off, they cannot listen to, understand and respond to communication and commands from people. And they're likely to be a danger to themselves and to the home. If they're at the home, they can be destructive and they can be dangerous to humans and other dogs. So why we're here and why I'm so passionate about bringing all the, these beautiful expert speakers together for this summit is that there is so much we can do to help anxious dogs. And some of those things that you're going to learn in this, this summit might not be things you've ever heard of before, because we've got a really broad spectrum of people. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask each of our um, guests on this panel to have um, about five minutes. I'm just going to set a little time up here so we don't run over time to talk about their topic that they're covering in the summit. And we're going to start off with Teodi. So Teodi, welcome. Lovely to have you here. And um, what are you talking about? Let us, what's the deal? I'm very excited to be a part of your summit. So this is, this is really exciting because I run about maybe 25 to 30 calls a week and a good chunk of them are with anxious and fearful dogs and it manifests in so many different ways. So one of my favorite topics is what I'll be talking on for the summit is why aversives don't help with anxiety. And I want to make it very clear that it's not a very, it's a very non-judgmental. A lot of times when you start talking about aversives, it gets everybody riled up on the internet and we have opinions here and opinions here and it's uh -huh. not who I am. I want to talk about the science as to why you shouldn't use aversives. And by aversives, I'm defining them as anything that's unpleasant to the dog. And as we know, fear and anxiety can take the form of many ways. Some dogs will cower and run. Some of them will get aggressive. The most aggression is based in fear. So if a dog is afraid of other dogs or afraid of other people, one strategy that dog might employ is to make itself all big and scary so the scary thing goes away. And when you have a dog that is barking and lunging and pulling and acting crazy already in that fight or flight response, it can be a natural human reaction to tell the dog to shut up or knock it off or use a prong collar or a shock collar or something to just make that behavior stop. And it doesn't treat the problem. So what my presentation is about, why it doesn't treat the problem, and some alternatives that will work better. Because what we want is we want to help these animals. We want to help these dogs overcome their anxiety. So let's use stuff that works. So using aversives, can it make things worse for anxious dogs? It can absolutely make things worse. It can also damage the relationship with the person who's applying the aversive. So a really good example would be a dog that is terrified of other dogs, so it reacts in an aggressive manner. And you put a prong collar on that dog. And the prong collar, for those who don't know, it has the little prongs in it. It goes into the neck. And so 
every time the dog sees another dog and starts to tell you that the, he's afraid, you yank on that collar and tell the dog to be quiet. So now the dog has associated other dogs with that punishment. So he's convinced he was right all along. And this is a terrible situation and he doesn't want anything to do with these dogs. And he, you should have listened to him from the start. So you started out with maybe a certain level of red zone, as you talked about. And now we're into scarlet, very flames zone because the dog has been convinced that it's worse. It sometimes can create other problems as well. So there's a lot of baggage involved with aversives that, that you can bypass altogether with different methods. So, um, you know, in my opinion, anytime you use an aversive, you're, you're harming your relationship with the animal because, you know, like if a human comes up to you and slaps you in the face, um, or if you've got, if you're in a relationship with someone and they, they use hurtful words with you, it always damages the relationship to some extent. Yeah. It absolutely can damage your relationship. If, if you were scared of snakes, if snakes scared you and I came and poured snakes all over you and said, aren't you, aren't they nice? They're soft. They, they're more afraid of you than you are of them. You're not really loving snakes now. And you also don't like me for putting you in that situation. So yes, it can damage your relationship. And I don't think people realize that. Um, it's so hard for certain dogs with anxiety and fear to develop relationships in the first place. Some dogs are coming from a place of such fear and anxiety that it's hard for them to trust. And we wanna build up those relationships with trust. We don't want to degrade them and make them worse. I think too, another thing about aversives is that they're not relaxing and calming the dog. So they're actually making the physiological state of anxiety more intense, yeah? Right, exactly. And, and what I want is that dog to um, calm down. I want that dog to focus on me and realize that in, in that relationship that I'm gonna help. A lot of these dogs that, that especially react aggressively, they see a situation that frightens them and they say, I got this. And then they take care of it. And dogs make bad decisions all the time. They're making a terrible decision. So what I would prefer and what I try to teach my clients and their dogs is if that dog is afraid, all right, I want that dog to look to me and go, can you help me with this? And I'm like, I got you. I got you. The, here are the techniques that I'm going to use to make you feel more safe in this situation. Yeah, and that's a big part of being a benevolent leader for our dogs so that they start looking to us every time they don't know what to do. It's like, okay, this person's got it. I'm just going to look to them, yeah? And right. that's a really important thing too. Thank you so much for sharing a little bit about your um, presentation that we're all going to be enjoying, the, uh, you know, uh, going really into depth about why aversives are really not helpful and um, getting some alternatives to be able to find out what are the good things to do. So thank you so much, Teodi. And you, now we're going to move to Lisa. So Lisa, um, what's your talk about? How are you going to help these anxious pets? Well, if it's not obvious, I'm all about sound and music. And right. I am going to talk about sound as a thing. It's just an invisible thing that everybody has in your canine household. So whether it's a sound that you can control, like appliances and electronics, or it's a sound that you can't control, like a motorcycle or construction outside, I'm going to be giving tips with how to take back control of your dog's environment. You know. We are responsible. I am so passionate about this topic of helping dogs through sound, not only music, but also sound that I believe, you know, in order to be a really wonderful caretaker for our beloved pets, it's our responsibility to really control that sound environment as much as we can because they don't have a choice. They have to like our music. They don't go, unless you have a really skilled border collie, they're not going to go turn on their own playlist. So it's up to us to be responsible for that for them. It's um, and I think, too, it's really important for us to be aware that our dogs and cats have a range of hearing that goes far beyond ours. And there's a whole lot of high frequency and low frequency content that we don't even hear that can be really uncomfortable and unpleasant for our dogs. Yeah, exactly. And they they can also, you know, so dogs here, I'll talk about this in my interview with you, that dogs here almost twice as far and as high as we do and cats are twice as much as dogs so your 
your dog or cat might be responding to something that you don't even hear that's, you know, two blocks away. I've heard stories of cats, stop, they stop eating for the week when construction is two blocks away. But they can also associate a sound with a place. So you have a dog and mm-hmm. all of a sudden mm-hmm. he's afraid of going into the garage and you think he's afraid of the garage. Well, you what you don't realize is that last week he was walking by the dryer the dryer buzzed right when that dog was right in front of the dryer and created a fear and now he begins to associate that that fear is in that place and so that's why it's really we really want to take responsibility and be aware and just know of the sounds in our environment so there's there's an you so we're talking about Two things I think here. One is minimizing sound pollution for our animals, but then the other one is actively using sound as an intervention or a medicine or a prescription to help um, anxious dogs be calmer and relax. Yeah, exactly. I play piano for dogs. I I record music for pet stress. That is based on research of combining the right lower frequencies with the right speed, with the right simplification, with the things that have been proven to calm the canine nervous system. And that's why the music I've recorded is in so many shelters and increasing adoption rates. And it just means the world to me that I can use my music talents to help improve the lives of dogs. Yeah, I think that's really cool. I think it's really awesome. And especially that your music is playing in so many shelters and and have the people in the shelters noticed a difference in these rescue animals, traumatized animals when from before and after they've brought this music into the shelters? Yeah, so it's not only the animals, but it's the people. So what happens is the music helps create a calming environment for the visitors also in the shelter. And because of that, the visitors stay longer and because they sting longer, adoptions increase. And that also helps, you know, the dogs have been listening to it before the visitors got there. And I've heard lots of very heartwarming stories of dogs that have been there a year and they were, they were so anxious, could not get adopted. A couple of days with the music I've recorded and, and they're off to a lovely forever home. That is just so heartwarming and beautiful. Thank, thank you, Lisa. You. Thank and you. thank you for sharing a little bit about what you're going to be speaking about in the summit. Now we're going to come to Sean, who um, is Earth Buddy products, which are cannabis based um, extracts. And yes. as most people should know by now, um, whole plant, CBD rich, low in THC uh, hemp extracts have extraordinary medicinal benefits for our dogs so sean let me let's um what are you going to be i think we have not exactly a presentation from you but let's talk a little bit about how your products uh can help animals yes absolutely so cbd in particular um has gained a ton of popularity over the past five to six years um and for us primarily it's been around stress and anxiety um there's a lot of potential and there's a lot of ways it can help. Um, but there's definitely, um, a a caveat. I always try to explain to pet parents and I'm so glad to be on the panel with everyone, because I think there needs to be a real comprehensive plan and using a supplement or a plant medicine like, um, cannabinoids, um, should be a tool in that comprehensive plan and, and really having a, a, broader scope and when we're looking at it. So um, in terms of, you know, what I'm going to be talking about is really about how the the cannabinoid CBD cannabidiol um, from a mechanistic standpoint actually works in the body. And because there's not a lot of data right now on it, we actually just conducted a study right in the prime of fireworks and thunderstorm season um, with with a good size um, of real world pet owners to um, use our products and explain to us what um, the benefits were and did it calm their dog during these really stressful times. Um, There's some really interesting data on how many pets run away during the 4th of July weekends, Mm -hmm. usually Um, more pets than any time of year. And I'm sure it's different where you're at, but um, anytime they're lighting fireworks off or thunderstorms are more regular, um, that's going to be an issue. And, you know, if we can help with that in a small way in in conjunction with the other uh, people on the panel, I, I think there's a good 
mix of what we can provide for a pet owner and hopefully, you know, keep them as relaxed as possible during these stressful times. Yeah. And I think one thing that, that I will stress too, is that there ain't no silver bullet or no right. single silver bullet for anxiety in dogs. Um, it's a complex issue and you're nearly always going to have to experiment with multiple kinds of interventions before yeah, you absolutely. find the right combination for your dog. And even then, as you progress through the evolution of the treatment, um, you're often going to have to, to drop some things that stop working so well and pick up other things that are more appropriate for your dog's uh, circumstances when you get to different stages of how they're going. Could you talk to us a little bit about all the other benefits of CBD health wise for dogs? Yeah, so in a in a really simplified way, um, all mammals and even some exoskeleton um, bugs have a cannabinoid system. So we naturally produce these chemicals in our body, and this system is a chemically balancing system. So when we have an extract that has um, compounds that mimic these natural chemicals we make, it engages that system to create a a balance or homeostasis. So um, when we look at using CBD, it is much less intoxicating than its um, sister in THC. So um, THC is the more um, euphoric, high causing molecule, whereas CBD is much less um, intoxicating. We like to use that word as opposed to psychoactive, because when what we're talking about is mood, and we actually think that there's a lot of mood balancing benefits for CBD. Yeah, it's a, it's an amazing medicine. It um, the endocannabinoid system is is a very deep metabolic system in the body and regulates all sorts of other systems. Yes. So I I found that I CBD can also be helpful for um, any kind of inflammation and pain, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, immune problems. It can be helpful in cancer to be at least palliative in in some cases. More than that, um, we've had a case in our hospital just recently. They've been putting CBD topically on this little, very old dog's um, tumor, and it has shrunk to a tenth of its size within a month or two. So you can get some outliers like that, uh, epilepsy, IBD, um, and it's very, very safe. So that's the other beauty of this very powerful herbal medicine is not only is it good for anxiety, you're going to be benefiting your anxious dog's um, health and well-being in multiple other ways if they go on that okay so the, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Sean, oh no i was just going to add to that i mean everything you just listed off in my opinion is is kind of an inflammatory response so if we can help with that in any way um and and we've seen that and that's why we see so many people using cbd for a myriad of reasons absolutely inflammation is the is, is also a problem in anxiety because yep. when you get inflammation um, and pain, and this is another thing I learned at this conference I was at just last week, it potentiates a lot of the um, chemical pathways of anxiety, neurochemical pathways of anxiety in the brain. So, so treating your animals for pain is um, a really important thing for your anxious animals. There's a lot of animals with undiagnosed pain and it makes anxiety significantly worse. So now what we're going to go through is um, the second section of this kickoff um, party for us all to get super excited about um, how much we're going to be able to help our anxious dogs from what we learn in this summit. So we're just quickly going to go through with each of our speakers and ask what are their top three things that dog carers carers of anxious dogs, um, traumatized dogs, rescue dogs, any kind of anxiety. And of course, sometimes anxiety can just look like a dog that goes stupid, crazy, um, overactive when people come to visit as well. That is anxiety if the animal can't be calm and sensible when they're meeting new people or new dogs. That for me is is actually an anxiety problem. So Teodi, what are the top three things that you would um, suggest? Uh, the first one would be recognizing it. As, as you mentioned earlier, I get a lot of people when I go into their homes and the dog is a little hesitant. I'm like, oh, your dog's a little shy. Oh, no, she's not. I'm like, yeah, yeah, she is. She really is. Um, know what the symptoms are. You know, learn what the symptoms are. Hopefully you'll learn them during the summit. Um, but also know that in that related to that is that a well-behaved dog isn't necessarily fine. 
So just because your dog is not lunging and not screaming and not jumping on people, but is very quiet and very subdued, some people are thrilled with this. We all want our dogs to behave, but sometimes that dog is suppressed and that dog is really quite fearful. I see that a lot in very young puppies. Mm -hmm. And then I don't get called till adolescence. So the dog is now exhibiting that aggression or that outlying behavior. And when I start asking questions about the dog's puppyhood, the dog was so well behaved and so easy and it never did anything at the vet. It just sat on the table and they could do anything to it. And that dog was actually stressed the entire time. And so when they're babies, they don't have the guts to do anything about it. But once they get into adolescent, they realize that they, they can, it's too much for them. Yes, they just go. So recognizing fear would be my first one. My second one would be don't wait. Please don't wait. So it's so much easier to help a six month old puppy than a six year old dog that has been exhibiting anxiety. It's never too late. I don't want people to not go if it's late, but please don't wait. Don't think that the dog will outgrow it um, because it's just getting worse. Anxiety, I tell people all the time, fear just gets worse, especially as they get older. Yeah, you know, yes. they get older and the, the sight starts to go and the hearing starts to go. So everything is scary. And so I don't wait, please get help um, from your entire team, your whole holistic team, get, get, get help uh, as soon as you can, as soon as you notice or suspect, maybe you haven't quite recognized it, but bring in someone who, who knows what to look for. The last thing would be, there's so many, see, I could list about uh, Yeah, I know, I, I got the same problem. <laughs> I know, the last one would be, um, don't give up. Yes. Don't be heart disheartened. It's it's so hard to have a dog who is afraid. You just want to tell them that they're going to be fine. You know, I, this is fine. I'm going to take care of you. It's all going to be okay. And you can't say that to them. They don't understand that. So it can be very frustrating for the pet parent as well as for the pet him or herself. So be patient with yourself as you go through this journey, because it is a painful journey as for you to go through as well. Yeah, and you know another thing that I think we'll we'll just touch on very quickly here is that it is kind of normal when you're working with an anxious dog that you're going to get improvement and then you're going to get backward steps. You might be two steps forward, one step back. Yes. It's not an uncommon pattern when you when you're helping these dogs. And um, I really do agree with you. There's a lot of dogs that have the freeze response of anxiety, so they go still and freeze, and they're still experiencing an immense amount of internal distress and emotional and mental pain so be aware of that too if you've got a dog that you got a new place and they kind of freeze that's definitely an anxious dog thank you so much to Eddie. and lisa what are the top three things that you would you would say people should consider well, I'm going to take Tiadi's first answer and apply it to sound because I wholeheartedly agree. Recognize the sounds in your canine household, in your home environment. And during our interview during the summit, I talked about uh, how the listeners can take a sound survey and actually take back control of those sounds. In 2020, you're probably familiar with a study that was done in Finland that showed that 72.5% of dogs were exhibiting anxiety. When I got into this field, and when I first came up with the idea in 2003, one out of seven dogs. So look at the increase in numbers. And I think that both of those numbers are low because what Tiani was saying is a lot of people don't recognize when their dogs have anxiety. So um, that leads into my second thing, which is music is a thing and it it's it's an invisible thing but it's a really important thing so when you apply music that's specially designed to calm the canine nervous system which during our interview i actually talk i mean i actually play i talk also yeah. but i actually played the piano and give a demonstration of that so you can use that as classical conditioning just like you would anything else for example you have a dog with separation anxiety you want to build an association at first you don't want to start playing the music when you're on the way out the door you want to play it for a week when you're home with your dog and yeah. build a conditioning response that the dog everything thinks everything is good with the world it's all good the music comes on it's my time to be calm before you gradually introduce it when you're gone which leads to the third thing which is so important which is it's all about both ends of the leash. I create music for both ends of the leash because if your dog is stressed and let's, I'm going to reword that. If you're stressed, chances are, if your dog is stressed, 
you're stressed because we love our dogs. So we're like, we don't know what to do about this thing that they have anxiety about. The first thing you want to work on is controlling your own stress because what yes. that energy will travel down the other end of the leash. And that's why the music I create is for both ends of the leash. That's a really good point, your last point. And there was some research that came out in the last two years, I think, that they looked at um, anxious people and anxious dogs in the same household. They took um, hair and measured cortisol levels, and they found that um, there was a very significant increase in cortisol levels in dogs in households with humans who were stressed. So it interestingly didn't go the other way. If you had stressed a stressed dog, the dog was stressed and the humans were calm that didn't have the reverse effect, which is kind of interesting, but it's really important. The human factor is massively important. And there's a number of speakers in this summit who will be touching on the human side of things and how important that is too. Thank you so much, Lisa. That's awesome. Three top things. And Sean, what are the top three things that you would talk about? And you've had a lot of rescue dogs. So you've probably had a lot of on the ground work of you know, helping anxious dogs quite apart from your um, business of, of helping animals with cannabis products. Oh, goodness. Yes, I have. And um, to piggyback off the ladies, I mean, one of the things that um, you hear in plant medicine a lot of times is set and setting. And that's very vague. So we've kind of refined it and said, uh, my number one thing is mindset and setting. So this applies for the dog and for the human. So the pet owner, um, so, you know, feeding off what the lady said, both, like, I think it's very important that we're in a calmer state, um, to try to help our pet that is stressed out. Mm -hmm. Um, if we're trying, especially in my case, when you're trying to administer something that they may not like, it's a plant extract. It's not always palatable. We have edible versions that are more palatable, but at the end of the day, um, the more concentrated forms sometimes are a little bit more effective depending on the animal. So having a calmer state as the pet owner, number one, and when you're administering it, um, will help that process go a little bit, uh, better. And then in terms of setting, it's like, where are you, where are you administering that? Are you doing it when they're already at level 5,000, um, stress, or are you doing it preemptively with a plan? So that's, that's kind of my mindset and setting applies to a lot of different facets it applies to the pet owner the pet and just the overall surroundings that you're trying to administer our products in so i think those are really important things i talk to pet owners pretty regularly almost every day um, when they reach out to us um, number two is that every dog is different there is yeah. not a one size fits all dose with our products and so you have to be very individualized and we're talking about a plant extract so um, it's not, um, it's not a pharmaceutical drug. It's not a highly synthetic drug. It's something that we extracted from a plant with minimal, um, you know, uh, process. And we try to keep it as true to what that plant produced. So when we get to dosing, it's really important that we start low and go slow. And we consider things like size, age, weight, um, you know, weight, in particular, I, I'm really interested in because, you know, a heavier dog or an overweight dog might not metabolize the same way as a super active, high energy dog. So the yeah. dosage is going to vary through that. Um, so, you know, the bottom line when it comes to dosage is every dog is different and to start low and go slow. So we're not just thinking, you know, we have the tendency to think more is better sometimes. Um, last but not least is I think this fits in with, with what we're all talking about is um, create a plan or a schedule and journal. it. I think that's really important. Um, how do you know if something's working? You're with them every day. So you just kind of assume things like we don't know how stressed they actually are because sometimes they're not showing it. Um, but there could be so many other factors. There could be, you know, a lower quality diet, upsetting their stomach, causing more stress. Um, there's a number of other things that, you know, we apply to stress. So having a plan or a schedule and actually journaling it will help. Um, and then, you know, kind of building on that plan is having a, a way to use this product functionally with other modalities. And I think that the other two modalities we are talking about here are, are perfect for using our products in conjunction with what they're going to do. So um, it's nice that I am not 
just up here trying to sell something um, because we can actually help like a, an actual problem. And we're just another tool, but ultimately I think it works very synergistically um, with the group here. Thank you so much. That Those are all really useful um, ideas and suggestions, um, particularly with your second point about every dog being unique. Every dog that anxious has a unique kind of anxiety. And um, it's really important to understand that so you can meet the individual unique needs of that anxious dog when we're, we're intervening and working up a treatment plan and all that sort of thing. So um, I'm going to add in my, my top three things too here because I think it's it's a good idea. So, you know, my number one thing is is kind of like the, the don't wait thing, but be proactive. Be really dynamic and proactive would be what the first thing I'd say is that when you're interacting with an anxious dog, it's going to be a project, you know, it's it's going to require um, time and energy in researching, in working with various professionals and then implementing a whole lot of interventions and, and tracking. And the third thing that Sean said about having a journal and monitoring is so important because then it's only if you're measuring and keeping track of how your dogs respond with each different intervention that you can stay on top of and hopefully you know get to a really good outcome where you've got a dog that's that's not anxious at all um a second thing that i would say is appreciate your dog appreciate how beautiful they are and how much joy and how much love they bring into your life i mean you know i've got this little guy here who um he is just the funkiest weirdest little guy that you're ever going to meet but he is kind of he's a reactive type of dog he's got an arousal bias and tends to go into arousal pretty quickly and and if someone comes is tends to want to bark at them and carry on like a pork chop now there's no way that mitzi would have sat here this close to pavati and pearl um three or four years ago he just would not have been able to tolerate being that close to other animals so I've been, I work with him all the time. You know, we've got an ongoing um, anxiety sort of management treatment plan with this little guy and he has just changed and become so much calmer and so much happier and so much more connected with me as a result. So, but I think if you appreciate all the amazing, lovely things and the beauty that your dog brings into your life, it's going to help you stay motivated if things get a bit tough. If you come home and, oh, God, they've chewed another dog bed into shreds and, um, you know, then if you come from a place of appreciation for your dog, you're not going to get angry and frustrated and start shouting at them, which TOD mentioned is not helpful because that's an aversive. And, you know, I get frustrated with my dog sometimes. Pearl's old and with her dementia kicking in, her anxiety has got worse and she's starting to poo on the floor you know, which you never used to do now and then. And I get frustrated with that. I do. You know, we're human. We do get frustrated, but it's important not to leak it out into our dogs. And the third thing um, that I would suggest is, is get skilled up. Learn as much as you can about all the different possible ways that you can help your anxious dogs, because the more you learn, the more you can be able to help your dogs. Okay, so now we're going to have a little bit of a case study. Um, so we're going to talk about how um, each of our beautiful experts here today would treat Pippi, who is a six month old rescue dog who's had a traumatic history, who exhibited some signs of anxiety before being desexed, but after she went off to the veterinary hospital and had to stay in hospital and came home, um, she is now displaying strong signs of anxiety with severe reactivity, lunging, barking, and will accelerate or escalate to aggression if, if the people are not careful. Um, to new people and to other dogs while on lead. And she's also now destructive and obviously distressed when left alone at home for any length of time and is showing other signs of anxiety when the people are at home. Restlessness, panting, extreme clinginess, um, and especially when people are going to leave, 
she's going, oh my God, I'm going to be left alone. I'm going to die because there's a tiger in this house. Can't you see the invisible tiger that's going to eat me? Um, so let's go through. Um, you've got to, we're going to spend about five minutes max with each of you. And we might shake up the order this time. We might start off with Sean so that we, we um, just, it's good, I think, sometimes to change things up. Sean, what do you think? So with puppies, um, we, we are not big on using just CBD as a way to treat anxiety and aggression, um, especially in puppies. They have a developing endocannabinoid system, and there is not enough data at this point. The, the dog's name is Pippi, so she's not a puppy. She's six months, oh. so probably eight months, nine months old. I'd say. Okay. So okay. with younger dogs, though, we typically we we typically um, say that you should definitely use it functionally. So with Tiati, like I would say, if they're going to use our products, I think using it functionally with a trainer is probably the best way to start our products. What yep. often happens is um, pet owners will come to the product and they'll think that's just going to fix the issue and not put in the work with a trainer um, or not, you know, create a setting that is uh, more relaxing, like, um, with what Lisa does. So like, I think there needs to be a comprehensive plan. And again, I, I love talking about our products and how much they help pets, but, but I think this should be a very low dose start that is used functionally in practice. So, um, low dose twice a day, probably is the usual dose rate and keep a really close observation on how, or if CBD is making any visible difference with the animal, because like any intervention, um, you're going to get some animals that it works really well for, some that it works a little bit for, and you're going to get some animals that that it might not make any noticeable difference at all. And the the other thing I'd say too is that it's important to you know be working with with medical professionals, veterinarians, trainers, complementary and alternative holistic practitioners, and of course all of your other supplements and dietary changes and things like that. Yes, I I mean I think. Um using it as a tool, as opposed to like, like you said, the silver bullet is the best way to look at it. And usually from a dosage standpoint, um, we have plenty of cases where people start and they, they see a difference right away in their pet's demeanor and kind of overall attitude, but some pets, for whatever reason, they don't see any response. And especially in Pippi's case, it's getting very aggressive at this point. So we would want to make sure that we gradually build up that dosage and we're not just like, give them a ton of it. And then, you know, in some cases, the dog can be overly sedated, which creates a, a kind of negative reaction from the pet owner, like, hey, what did this do to my pet? So there's, there's a fine balance. And we always say, start low, go slow, and you can gradually build up on it as needed basis. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Lisa, what, what would you, if, if someone rang you up and said, you know, well, I found your website and, and see that you're doing this beautiful calming music for dogs. Um, I'm just desperate here. How can, how can you help me with my anxious pippy? What would you say to them? Well, first I want to be clear. If, um, it was this situation with pippy and aggression and similar to Sean's answer, I want to be clear. I'm not a trainer. I'm not a certified trainer. I'm not, that's not my profession. I, the first thing I would do is probably refer them to Tiati, who is skilled in this. What I can provide though, is an additional modality, just like Sean kind of as well. So it's an additional modality. And, and what I can say is that most people who have used the music that I create, that's, that's based on research that especially designed to calm dogs. It is usually not where they start. It's usually where they end. So in other words, your dog is, let's say this aggression case or it's thunderstorms and it's like they've tried everything else and nothing has worked. And then, you know, they've read the instructions, they should wait and do the classical conditioning, but they're in the middle of the storm or the fireworks and they put the music on and it works. And sometimes that does happen. So what I can absolutely promise is unless you play my music too loud, which you don't want to do, you want to play it at a gentle volume, unless you play it too loud, it cannot do any harm. So no matter what, if you contact Tiati and she's two, it's two weeks before she's available, you could use the music that I create for calming the canine nervous system at mm -hmm. home um, in, in the way that veterinarians prescribe it, which is 
30 minutes a day, nighttime is a great time as you're getting ready for the nighttime routine. And it's not, you don't want to start it when Pippi's most reactive, most aggressive. You want to start it when they're going to build a classically conditioning response that this is a calming time. It means to be calm. So that's what I would do if I was consulted in that situation. Beautiful. Thank you. And Teodi, um, what, what would your suggestions be? And I'd imagine you probably work with vets quite a bit too, with animals that are under veterinary care, yeah? I do, and I am not a vet. I am not a veterinarian, nor do I play one on television. I am not a veterinarian. And clients, well, what should I give them this? Or should we try this drug? I'm like, whoa, 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 no, no. I'm <laughs> behavior modification. I'm your girl. I'm your behavior mod. We're going to work on that. Sometimes behavior mod can work by itself, depending. But in the yep. case of Pippi, Pippi is a hot mess. Pippi has some issues. <laughs> And so the first thing I would say is let's get a thorough veterinary checkup to make sure there's nothing physical going on with Pippi, to make sure that that there's no pain or no eye eye issues or hearing issues or orthopedic issues that are causing her to react in this manner. Let's, Let's get the vet on board right away. If the veterinarian recommends medication, holistic, different kinds of medication, let's employ those modalities as a team. And I not only encourage that, but want everybody to be on the same page. I want to talk to the vet and I want the vet to be able to call me and I want to be able to talk to the, the, you know, the yeah. companies that are producing yeah. the products and say, let's get some good products. Don't just go and pick something off the shelf. You know, let's, let's do some, some, some research and get something quality into poor Pippi uh, to help her better. But it's definitely a team approach. I think that works best. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you're lucky and sometimes this medication works well and sometimes it doesn't. But a lot of times too, it will, you'll see a success at the beginning, but the issues haven't been addressed underneath. And so it's really simmering and it can escalate later. So while they may take this product or listen to this or, or do something and it, and, it, and it seems to help, if you have the experts working together and seeing the dog, like, you know what, she's still stressed. She's still not taking treats in this situation. Let's try not to put her over threshold. Let's work together to, to see success with her. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's really good advice. And I think um, I think one of the key things that I hope everyone takes home from today and, you know, come and, come and register for the summit. It's totally free. You're going to get uh, 20 of us giving you stacks of very uh, high-level information about how to help anxious dogs. The more you have a team-based approach, the better outcomes you're going to get. And the more all of your team are on board and communicating and understanding what the other team members are doing, again, the better outcomes you're going to get short, medium and long term for your dogs. And I think, um, you know, with Pippi, the first thing I would be doing would be um, taking a really detailed history, trying to find out as much as I could. I mean, often with rescue dogs, the history is just a blank before you get them right and you you never you can never know but you can have a pretty firm idea of how much they've been abused by their behavior i think so you know i'd be wanting to take a really detailed history and getting really curious about when did it first start what were the signs what makes it worse have we got with anxiety too um you're often going to have multiple anxiety syndromes and conditions happening comorbidly or at the same time in any anxious dog. So we've got to get clear about, okay, what are the anxieties? Have we got separation anxiety plus sound sensitivity plus reactivity? Um, You know, all these different things need to be thought about for when we go into um, helping that dog. So we've got to start off with an assessment, making diagnosis, and then we have the you have to do environmental management, behavior mod, um, medication, which can be, you know, complementary and alternative supplements, herbals and prescriptions. And then we've got to monitor the animal and be responsive to what we're seeing when we monitor them. And, you know, that's the key thing. And what you're going to find out in this summit is a whole lot of different things that can be integrated into this. Uh, multimodal treatment plan to help your anxious dogs, you know, and you can help them. That's another thing that I want to stress. And I'm sure that um, all three of our 
our experts here today would do the same thing. You can help them. It can take time. It can take effort. It can take working with getting the right people and the right treatments and everything in place. But um, it's very rare that we can't make a really significant difference with these anxious dogs with this kind of approach. Okay, so um, we're going to just ask for a final, uh, you know, takeaway, little short takeaway from each of our speakers. Um, I'm going to then um, tell you briefly about all of the other amazing speakers and what they're going to be speaking about in this summit. And I am so sincerely hoping that that together we're inspiring you to, to leap on and register and come and learn with us about how to help anxious dogs, because this is one of my great passions in my veterinary work is, is helping anxious dogs. You know, I had two anxious dogs come into the clinic yesterday. One of them, the people didn't realize at all, really, that there was a problem. Um, the nurse dropped a pen, the dog went like this. I said, oh, see that? Two dog sensitive to noises. And they said, oh, oh, actually, yeah, it is. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about how we can help this dog. So, you know, you may not know how anxious your dog is, and you will learn about that too in this summit. And even if you don't have an anxious dog, if you come to this summit, you're going to learn so much about how to prevent anxiety in your dogs too, which is going to be a win, right? So let's start off with Lisa. What would be your one, your one takeaway? Five years ago, I fell and I injured my right hand so severely that I had seven fractures that required four surgeries and a numerous amount of alternative therapies to heal. But at the time, I was told by my first hand therapist that I didn't stay with long, that I would never play piano again. I've proven her wrong because first of all, I started playing with my left hand only and, and years later, I'm playing full concerts with two hands. My new hand therapist, after firing the first one, I went to a new <laughs> one, stayed with her for 186 therapy sessions. Whoa. She said something to me that can be applied to everyone with an anxious dog. Little by little. Yes. It's little by little got me through my emotional recovery and my physical recovery. And in the process of little by little, reward the tiniest bit of improvements. Yes, over that is and over. gold. That is beautiful gold. That is um, uh, that is such a good take home. Thank you so much. And and Sean, what's your one? I was going to say we could just end on Lisa's. No, I'm yeah, we could, we could. We really, we really uh, no, that was that was beautifully put, and it, it's a it's a great story. Um, I think when it comes to um, stress and anxiety, it's I mean, the amount of pets in America, which is where we primarily work, um, you know, have increased, you know, to, I think it's about a hundred million pet owners in America now. Um, a lot of those pets were rescues during the pandemic. So um, there's a lot of stress pets with people going back to work. And so we can do a lot of good with this, with this summit. And I think there's a lot of different ways we can help, but I think I'm so excited to kind of come up with comprehensive plans for pet owners. Cause if you've been a pet owner for longer than five years, like you've had multiple pets, at least one of them was probably stressed at one point. So there's definitely something we can all take away from here. And not, even I will take something away from uh, the other panelists for sure. Absolutely. I've learned so much doing the interviews with everyone. I got to tell you, and, sure. you know, I've got a passion for anxiety and been a vet for 27 years and I've learned a stack. So imagine how much um, you, you guys will learn. Teodi, what's your take home? My take home would be um, don't get so caught up in the why your dog is afraid that you get stuck. We always want to know why. Why is he this way? And why could this have happened? And sometimes we find out and sometimes we don't. As you mentioned earlier, sometimes, especially with rescues, we have no history. Um, sometimes it doesn't make sense, but fear itself doesn't make sense. I was in the car driving a couple months ago and I saw a spider on my windshield. And so I hit the windshield wipers and they didn't touch the spider. Oh, dear. So I realized he's in the car and I almost ran off the road. I, I didn't, but I've never been bitten by a spider. I've never been attacked by a spider. No, no team of spiders has ever overrun me on this, but it was the spider and it was fear. I just, i had a reaction. So sometimes we can find out why your dog is acting that way. But I find sometimes that that limits us in moving forward. 
And with all the things that everyone's going to learn at the summit, they're going to learn all these techniques and, and ideas and, and hope to give them to deal with their anxious and fearful dogs. We're going to leave the why behind sometimes and just deal with the dog in front of you. I tell my, to my clients all the time, deal with the dog in front of you. It may be a different dog than you had yesterday, even though it's the same dog. But today this dog is afraid. So let's let's help the dog now. That is really good advice. And, and, and my take home is going to be just bring one or two or new things in at a time. Don't try to do everything all at once because you're going to learn about so many different possibilities in this summit. You need to make a short list and a wish list and have no more than three things on your short list. Implement them, measure the response, a journal the response, and then um, if things don't seem to work, then you'll discard them and put them in not the bin you'll put them in the backup tray because at another time they might work better too you know sometimes you go back and something you tried when the dog's in the really acute stages and really a hot mess oh that thing's not going to work in that situation but maybe it's six months down the track when you've done a ton of behavior mod and they've been on various treatments and they're better you might try that thing again and it might suddenly make a really big difference once the animal has been brought back down to a more you know green zone state and not in a hot red mess um so that's the other thing i'd say about this is that you come along to this summit you're going to learn heaps of stuff but don't try to do it all at once that is not going to lead to good outcomes for you or, or your dog um, i'm just going to quickly run through uh what else is going to happen on this summit so um on day one which is focusing on understanding the problem of anxiety in dogs I'll be speaking about how one way to look at anxiety is that it's simply a state of arousal that has got nowhere to go, that the animal can't regulate themselves out of. We've got Dr. Ava Freak, who's gonna be talking about getting to the why of anxiety and some novel um, treatment ideas for that. Dr. Christina is gonna be talking about understanding and resolving human and environmental triggers of anxiety. Dr. Janet Reich is talking about separation anxiety and essential oils. And Anna Maria Vasquez is going to be talking about everything is energy. So anxiety in dogs and the energetics, the subtle energetics behind it. And Laurie Edge Hughes, who's an amazing physiotherapist, is going to be talking about sensory integration and anxiety in dogs. So that's day one. Day two, we're going to be talking about all um, alternative and holistic options. Uh, Dr. Jean Huffy is going to be talking about flower essences. And of course, we're going to have Lisa with her talk about music. Dr. Jeff Feynman is talking about the vitality and balance system. And um, there's particularly one thing he's going to talk about is really good way of tracking your animals overall well being and how happy or not happy they are. Dr. Kara Gubbins is going to talk about how animal communication can and can't help dogs with anxiety. Um, Dr. Barry Sands is going to talk about creating harmony and coherence within yourself to support your anxious pets. And um, Jed Davis is uh, going to be a presentation about an objective approach to a stress free pet. Then on day three, we're talking dog training and socialization. So we have Dr. Ian Dunbar, who's talking about fear periods and puppies and development stages. And, you know, he's talking about really how he thinks fear periods uh, don't exist at all and why he thinks that, but particularly talking about how important socialization is to prevent anxiety. Of course, we're going to have Teodi on that day with why versus make anxiety worse. Kamal, who's another um, amazing trainer, talking about positive reinforcement in behavior modification. And Ness Jones is going to talk about decoding separation anxiety. Then day four is going to be digging a bit more into the veterinary treatment of anxiety. Dr. Alex Avery is going to be talking about why you absolutely need a veterinary examination and workup to make rule out underlying causes that might be contributing. Dr. Christopher, Christopher Packle, who I'm so happy to have on the summit, he's a, a registered board certified specialist in behavior, veterinary behavior animal behavior. He's going to be talking about veterinary prescription medications, when and why they might be helpful to get the best outcomes for your pets, your dogs. Dr. Matthew Muir is going to be talking about integrative med 
medicine and diet for anxiety. Dr. Sharice is going to be talking about vet and pet wellness um, anxiety. So talking about the interaction between you and dogs and vets and how you can help your vets not be so stressed. I'll be talking about healing anxiety with intentional touch as part of the behavior modification. And Dr. Fossum is going to be talking about CBD as a treatment for anxiety. So as you can see, we have got an amazing program of just so much useful information that will transform your ability to connect with, to understand, and to help heal your anxious dogs. So I'm excited, and I hope that you are you know, rushing right now to click on that register button, totally free to come along and attend live. Um, I hope we see you there. And thank you to our beautiful panel guests, to Eddie, Lisa, and Sean. We're all gonna give you a big wave goodbye. I think we've covered everything we need to cover. And I'm going to be really looking forward to seeing you all in the summit and in the live Q&A sessions as well every day. I'll be answering questions every day. So we'll see you there. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.